Thank you so, so very much, Nancy and Susan. This is an incredible honor to be a recipient of this award from Foreign Policy and from CGD. Um, it is um, sad that Noises couldn't be here. I was um, looking forward to giving him a big, tight hug. Uh, it's really fortunate that one of my greatest champions, my father, is here with us this evening, and that... <laughs> And unfortunate that my other two champions, my daughter and my husband, couldn't be here in person but are with us in spirit. And I know that my late mother is out there somewhere looking on and feeling very happy for me, not acknowledging ever that it, was, that it is her efforts that are being recognized. She shaped me. And I know that I would not be the recipient of this award if it were not for two very important ingredients. First the work and commitment to women in development of the previous president of ICRW, Myra Bouvenich, and the risk that she took in appointing me president of ICRW. So thank you, Myra. And the second, the dedication and hard work, often for very little reward, of the staff that I had the privilege to lead for more than a decade at ICRW, and the board of directors who so ably guided and supported our efforts. So. I want to say, without glasses in hand, that I raise a toast to Myra and the staff and board of ICRW, past and present. It was our combined efforts, together with the leadership of our many global partners, that helped shape the world that we are in today. A world in which key policy actors and decision makers recognize girls and women, particularly those in poverty, as contributors to and rightful beneficiaries of development and a world that acknowledges investments in girls' and women's rights, education, economic opportunities, and health as fundamental to stronger, more equitable, and more sustainable economic growth. So cheers to all of you, to all of us. Another factor that deserves recognition today is India, the country of my birth, whose education and economic opportunities benefited me greatly and that I took shameless advantage of. As I often say, growing up as a woman in India, one cannot be anything but angry at the inequities and indignities that characterize the lives of women, especially those who live in poverty, who despite their labor and their contributions to society are forgotten in the development equation. But India is also home to one of the strongest national women's movements comprised of articulate women researchers and activists who made the case for women's empowerment with passion and rigor as I was growing up there. They made me see that data combined with passionate advocacy was the only way forward. That is what led me to become what I now describe as an activist in researchers' clothing for the cause of women's equality. When circumstances brought me to the US, all roads led to ICRW. It was the only organization in town that did the work that I wanted to make my career. In fact, it seemed almost fated that I would work in ICRW. When I was teaching in India, the only available book that dealt with issues that my colleagues and I wanted to teach in our women's studies course at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Bombay was the book by Myra Bovenich, Women and Third World Poverty. It was the book that I taught from, little knowing that one day I would be working with and directly learning from Myra. My mother taught me that it is absolutely okay to brag in front of one's family, because otherwise you may be tempted to do so externally, and that is not acceptable. <laughs> Since I'm in the company of ICRW's development family tonight, I'm going to take this opportunity to celebrate a few of the impressive results that ICRW and its staff have achieved over the years. The early work on women farmers and their lack of access to key resources, work that ICRW is using today to inform the renewed interest in smallholder farmers. A groundbreaking paper that Myra wrote on how well-intended microenterprise programs for women failed because they were designed based on gender stereotypes, teaching women how to weave baskets and sew and embroider rather than produce goods that met market demand and generated a real income. Pioneering research as you, on the high prevalence of women-headed households and the disadvantages that they face because policies are based on a fictitious norm of a male-headed household. 
the research program that Nancy talked about that I had the privilege to lead on the vulnerability of women to sexually transmitted HIV because of their socioeconomic status, but leading from that then pioneering work on AIDS-related stigma. Evidence on the prevalence and costs of violence against women in India, which is recognized now um, as an epidemic um, and a public health problem. The Millennium Development Project that I worked on with Karen Grohn on gender equality and with Nancy and with Amina Ibrahim that convinced the UN General Assembly that goal number three had to be more than just about education targets and women in non-agricultural labor. And more than two decades of work on adolescence and the resulting advocacy on the consequences of child marriage and what to do about it. I could go on and on, but I must stop because that much bragging is too much even for family. <laughs> ICW's greatest impact, though, came from a stealth strategy that has remained a secret until today. The strategic placement of board members and staff in key positions in mainstream development organizations. <laughs> so I'm going to mention a few. Karen Grohn, formerly ICAW senior economist, now in USAID. Myra, previous president of ICAW, formerly at the IDB and now in the World Bank. There is a reason, after all, that the bank produced a WDR on gender. Nancy Birdsall, ex-chair of ICAW's board while at the IDB and now at CGD. Susan Levine, also former chair of ICAW board, now a board member of CGD. So we've got CGD covered. <laughs> Julie Katzman, who I thought would join us today, a member of, our bo of ICAW's board now, but also at the IDB, and Moises Naeem, who was board member of ICAW's while at the Foreign Policy magazine. And please don't let UNICEF know that I have a hidden agenda. <laughs> As we look ahead, ICAW under the leadership of my successor, Sarah Kambu, and the broader gender and development community needs to be vigilant about two consequences of our combined success. And I thought just to set the panel discussion going, I'd share the two. First, efforts to economically empower girls and women have contributed to a huge surge of investment in women's entrepreneurship. While this investment is clearly beneficial, let us not kid ourselves into believing that it is going to help the millions of women who live in desperate poverty. Entrepreneurship programs are about small and medium-sized businesses, and as a result, are targeted to women who live above the poverty line. Our goals for gender and development must stay focused on women who live in poverty and the pro-poor policies and social protection programs that will give them a more than just, a more than give them a more just return on their labor and an opportunity to survive and thrive as individuals. Admittedly, that is a complex challenge, but it is our job and it remains incomplete. Second, our effort to make the return on investment case, which we made very well, has gained considerable traction. But let us not get too carried away with that approach. There is a human rights rationale for gender equality and the empowerment of women that is much more powerful and universal than the instrumentalist argument. Navi Pillay, the, human, the UN Human Rights Commissioner, recently issued a wake-up call to all of us within the UN. Referring to the Arab Spring, she made the point that some of the most dramatic revolutions occurred in countries such as Tunisia, countries that had recently received high marks for progress towards the development goals. She reminded us that our work on development is often too narrowly focused on growth, on markets, and on private investment, with relatively little attention to e equality or human rights. As Ms. Pillay said, and I quote, we did not get the answers wrong, we just never asked many of the most important questions. It is important to remember that, and I quote again, participatory development is more sustainable, Accountable development is more efficient, non-discriminatory development is more equitable, and the empowerment of women, minorities, and marginalized communities mobilizes vastly more development resources to the cause. I end the quote. I could not agree more. Yes, they give us economic benefits, but equality and freedom are goals in their own right, goals that are worthy of our collective pursuit. To ignore them, is a disservice to our mandate and a betrayal of our commitment to the rights of, and well-being of women and children. So with those words of caution, I look forward to panel discussion and thank you very, very much for this award.